We start today's news at noon with this live look from our Wells Fargo Skycam in downtown Portland. That camera facing north. What you can't see from this shot is the subject of our top story this afternoon because that subject is a smell. A bad smell reported by people across the Portland area and southwest Washington starting last night. Thanks for joining us. I'm Drew Carney. Now there is still no confirmation from anyone on where exactly the smell came from or what caused it. Callitz County officials reported the odor in Kelso, but they say their monitors aren't showing any readings for gas or other substances. There were also reports south of there in Vancouver. Officials have checked pipelines, industrial facilities, still no signs of a source. Viewers called us, they texted us, they sent us emails about this overnight and into this morning. We've gotten tips from several areas around the region and we've uh, highlighted those areas right there on your map. A viewer named Karen Meanwhile said she smelled the odor up in Battleground. Another viewer named Lisa told us that she could smell it in Wilsonville. We do have a news crew working on this story today, so we'll keep you updated on what we learn. All right, with that, we're going to turn our attention to the Weather Center. Yeah, it's a big huh, Rod. <laughs> well, I mean, because we've been working on that this morning, and so far we haven't... No answers, right? That's, I know. Yeah. That's the situation. I am smelling something here, Rod, and I mm. believe it's a, uh, a change in your forecast. I have something you don't have in the studio. I have a window just to my left, and I can tell you, in about the last 10 minutes, the rain in downtown Portland has really picked up. It's just coming down at a pretty good moderate clip right now. So this is what we expected. Remember, a cold front's marching inland this afternoon, and the rain is pretty solid now from Seattle down through Portland and all the way down into Lane County into Eugene. I've been watching our lightning monitor, and we've had a few individual strikes over the past several hours along the southern Oregon coast and some inland strikes south of Roseburg. We are becoming increasingly unstable this afternoon, so there's at least a chance that you will hear a rumble of thunder at some point. But so far, it's mostly light to good old fashioned moderate rain. The darker green is moderate rain moving through downtown Portland uh, at this hour. Uh, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. Yeah, look how it's all filled in right there you go. All right, uh, Newport. Raindrops from Uquina Bay. We know we've had a quarter of an inch of rain already fall up in Astoria. We know down in wine country the road is wet, so that's a gloomy noon hour with rain coming down over the Dundee Hills. That's the main Serene Wineries camera. And there are raindrops here in downtown Portland. We're at 67. Basically, the rain is going to be likely through the 5 o'clock hour. Temperatures will be rain cooled into the low to mid 60s. Drying will take place this evening, maybe as soon as 6 p.m. We'll have your complete forecast coming up. All right, thank you, Rob. Let's get back to our local headlines this afternoon. We know at least one person was hurt and a police officer was also hit by a stray bullet during a shooting overnight in Portland Central East Side. It happened just after midnight near Southeast Grand and Burnside. Officers were already in that area when shots were fired from a few different moving cars. The person who we know was shot was taken to the hospital but is expected to be okay. The Portland officer who was hit by that stray bullet is also okay because the bullet hit the heel of his boot but didn't actually make it all the way through to his foot. So far, police have not made any arrests. Portland police have identified a man who was shot and killed in the Hazelwood neighborhood last week as 24-year-old Tayshawn Nash. He was shot last Thursday on the Max platform at 148th and East Burnside. Police also arrested 42-year-old Felix Juarez Perez a short time later. He's charged with Nash's murder. We still don't know if the two men knew each other or what led up to that shooting. A man accused of three Portland murders violated his parole 30 times in the months leading up to those three deaths. That's according to a new lawsuit filed by one of the victim's families. Mark Johnson was shot and killed near Dawson Park in North Portland in 2022. Investigators identified Joseph Banks as the suspect in Johnson's death and two others. Banks spent most of the last decade in custody before he was released to federal supervision. But according to attorneys for Johnson's estate, Banks violated the conditions of his release at least 30 times, and the probation office never alerted the court. Johnson's estate is suing the U.S. Probation Office, saying that their negligence led to Johnson getting killed. We reached out to the office about this, but haven't heard back yet. Records show that Banks has since been committed to the Oregon State Hospital. Last week, a 26-year-old homeless woman gave birth in a tent in downtown Portland. KGW's Blair Best talked to another homeless woman who says she was there and able to provide some help during the delivery. Southwest First and Harvey Mail by an orange tent. Someone is starting to give birth. 
It was just before 6 Saturday night when that harrowing 911 call came in from this homeless camp below the Morrison Bridge. All of a sudden, she's just like, Becky, help me, please help me. And I'm like, what, baby? And she goes, it hurts, it hurts. And I'm like, okay, well, let's call 911. Becky's 26-year-old friend, who's also homeless, was seven months pregnant when she went into labor in this orange tent. We put her on this cart right here. And then we'll her down there. As they waited for paramedics, Becky wrapped her in this blue tarp, the cleanest thing she had. And so I just told her, I was like, just relax. She goes, I'm scared. I said, it's okay. But time was running out. I'm not sure how imminent this was when it was tapped, but the baby's head and shoulders are out. The baby's head was crowning. I'm like, okay, baby, well, you're going to have to push. And I was like, please, you know, somebody get, get a blanket, a clean blanket. The first responders arrived about five minutes after the baby was born. She could have been alone. The paramedics took them to the hospital, and according to dispatch, the woman had fentanyl in her system and was still in the hospital at last check. This is the second reported time this year Portland Fire and Rescue have responded to a birth in a tent on the streets of downtown Portland. We train for this. We have a specific kit in all of our medical kits that are, in the event we're at an imminent birth, we're prepared to do so. I don't know that people are falling through the cracks as much as people aren't really receptive to receiving the system out there. Some women addicted, some women not addicted, you know, whatever the case may be, I wish there was just more outreach for women um, without chastation. Blair Best, KGW News. All right, some car owners in Washington have been waiting months at this point to get a new license plate, but the state believes it may have a solution by skipping a step in the production of the plates. The license plates are made in the state penitentiary in Walla Walla. Production issues at the facility and the COVID pandemic are both blamed for the backup. But starting next month, the state says it will no longer emboss the plates. That means the letters and numbers on those plates won't be raised. We're hoping that our customers will, will be relieved that they finally have their plate and that they don't have to keep going to our vehicle licensing offices and getting another temporary after the 60 days. The state is calling this move temporary, although 28 other states already use non-embossed plates, so Washington says it may move in that direction in the future. The state also says it hopes to be caught up on the license plate backlog by Thanksgiving. Oregon's housing crisis is typically hardest on people who are considered low income, but it's also creating challenges for middle income families. As part of a new series called Stuck in the Middle, KGW's Tim Gordon walks us through how a family of five was finally able to buy their first home at a time when interest rates were at an all time high. Inside a yellow house on a quiet street on the edge of Milwaukee lives the Driscoll family. So this is our kitchen, tons of storage. We love the storage. Experiencing the feelings that come with first time home ownership. It's finally feeling like home. For the family, it's like just knowing that this is our home. It's not you know, a temporary thing. There's no temporariness to it. Darren and Deanna's journey to buying their first home was about six years long. As they began to think about how to make it happen, COVID hit and made it more difficult to decide and commit. But when Darren's career changed and income increased, they re-engaged into a still difficult housing market. Yeah, there's some like little hiccups here and there where like one of the big ones was interest rates jumping. I mean, that was a huge burden like it was like oh we're so close and then we saw interest rates just keep climbing and as we we're looking at houses it was like yeah we're just not gonna be able to do it so we had to wait a couple more years but now they have this updated four bedroom single bath home they and their three kids love how did they finally do it well the short answer is with some help and it started with the down payment the driscoll's saved each month into an individual development account or ida it was matched three times over with federal funds through the nonprofit Portland Housing Center. The nonprofit, founded in 1991, has helped more than 10,000 families become successful homeowners through a variety of programs. For the Driscolls, it required time, discipline, and some required budgeting and homeownership education. So this was built in the 60s. But it got and, them over uh, the first and probably fun. biggest hurdle. You know, even higher income borrowers, for first-time home buyers, oftentimes the barrier to entry is the down payment. 
The Driscoll's loan officer with OnPoint knows firsthand the challenges many clients face. Dustin Johnson says a variety of options are available from both private and government organizations, including OnPoint's Zero Down program, which doesn't require you to pay mortgage insurance. It comes with a higher interest rate, but it's a way to get started. It's one of the most popular programs I use for first-time home buyers because it gets you in the door. And Johnson says you can always refinance later for better rates. Also, sticking with the same lender can save a lot on closing costs. In the case of the Driscolls, they didn't need the zero down, but did go with an adjustable rate mortgage, a seven-year arm. And that locks us into a seven-year kind of guaranteed rate, and it was low, it was 6.75, which is comparably low at the time. That was in March or April, I think it was. Open the door. Open it. Open it. And now, in September, they are loving their new reality, which includes space to play. I think when we saw the yard, it was kind of like all bets were off. It was like, okay, this is this is what's going to be. And that's good for everyone. We love this area. It's very quiet. The kids already have friends in the neighborhood, which we've never had before. Yeah. Nice. So the Driscoll's big advice is to be ready, but also be patient. And a key here, be flexible too, whether it's on the type of home or location, have an open mind that'll broaden your horizons and maybe you'll find the best choice outside of what you originally thought. It can also be helpful to have financing figured out before you start shopping so you know what you've got to work with. That makes sense, right? You know, there's a lot more to cover on this. There are other financing options and we didn't even touch on the low housing inventory or what lower interest rates bring to the equation. So we've got more stories to do and solutions to bring you if you're feeling stuck in the middle.